what is your professional background and where are you joining us from? I see about a third of you have completed the poll. We have more people joining us. Again, thanks for taking the time to zoom in. We are gonna be getting officially started just momentarily. I will give you another 10 seconds to complete the poll. So what is your professional background and where are you joining us from? Five, four, three, two, one. Ending polling, Pink. Okay, so thanks for zooming in. Um, I, it appears that uh, most of you feel that you are foresters. Um, we also have a good mixture of wildlife biologists and folks that work in conservation policy. We have a few members of the interested public that are here as well, and some are all of the above. Thank you so much for being part of this today. Um, where are you joining us from? We have a really nice mix. Um, of folks that are that consider themselves from northern Maine, from coastal or southern Maine, um, a few from western Maine, um, and a quarter from uh, New England, and uh, two two people are from outside of New England. Um, no Canadians today, and one person who says I am a global citizen. So hopefully that helps uh, our our uh, presenters get a little bit of a sense of where we are today. Um, let's see, Aaron, are you ready to take the reins and lead us into today's webinar? Aaron's here, you need to let him unmute. Let's see. Meg, is Aaron able to unmute himself? We need to make, make sure that he's a co-host. <laughs> Sorry, hang on one second. Okay, working on it. There we Thanks. go. Yep, Meg definitely holds all the strings, so so thank you. I was not able to mute my, unmute myself. Uh, thanks, Amanda, for getting us going, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Again, this is just a reminder that this is part of our monthly science and practice webinar. Uh, so we're almost on week seven, or week, month seven. So we're kind of moving along, and I think it's been a great series, and obviously with Amanda's help, has helped make it very um, facilitated and discussion-based, which is great. And I'm very excited about today's topic. And I really appreciate both uh, Allison Kenodi and Bill Livingston joining us today and, and um, giving us an overview on, I think, an important topic as we think about with forest health and, and climate change. Uh, this is one of those big unknowns is, is uh, what new pest and disease might present themselves. So I just want to formally uh, thank both of them. And I uh, will introduce both. They probably don't need introductions, but uh, Dr. Bill Livingston is an associate professor of uh, forest entomology at uh, the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine. He has a long experience, lots of expertise working on various forest health issues that I think he'll touch upon today. Uh, Allison Canote has been a longtime employee of the Maine Forest Service, worked on a variety of issues, and I think uh, has a nice perspective and always at the cutting edge of kind of the, the front lines of forest health issues. With that, as I as we have in the past, I'll turn it over to Amanda to kind of help facilitate us and get us going. So thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. Um, before we completely dive in, I want to just uh, do another very quick poll. Um, we're wondering if you did the pre-reading materials and what you found most interesting. And also um, we have a question, what do you perceive as test threats uh, from climate? If you didn't do the pre-reading, then you are going to learn a lot today. And luckily, the pre-reading is available on the FCCI website, which I believe Meg shared in the in the chat window. Um, so, um, if you uh, if you do the pre-reading before or after, then you will catch a video by Allison uh, talking about the brown tail moth life cycle and ties to climate change. And she'll have she has more time in the video to go into greater depth than she might have time today. Um, and Bill's video. Um, Guess that some of the, the changes, the climate changes, uh, climate change impacts on tree diseases in terms of tree susceptibility, stressors, and environment with some of the familiar uh, evil characters of, uh, you know, Baltimore, Willia Delgid, uh, white pine decline, uh, and a variety of stuff. So I'm going to end this poll in three, two, one. You guys are not voting very much. I'm slightly disappointed, but you have more chances to engage. Make sure you have good questions. So. Uh, many of you did not get to uh, do the, the reading yet. And again, make sure you do it because you will learn a lot. Um, but a lot of, oh, a good smattering of folks found the background uh, handout on gypsy moth and southern pine needle helpful. So other folks, make sure you check out those other videos. 
Um, so what do you perceive as pest threats from climate? Um, the winter that stands out, um, folks are, are noticed that new pests that can now survive in Maine um, with changing climate. Um, there are a lot of other issues related. Um, folks see uh, pests are moving north as the winter is warm. People perceive that there's an increase in pests due to higher precipitation. We'll get into some of that today. Also, greater defoliation and damage to trees, increased health concerns such as brown tail moss. Um, so, and then last but not least, um, you have an example of, uh, of pest problems that are directly related to climate that have impacted you. Um, I don't see any, any answers in the chat window yet, but we're going to hear quite a bit from our presenters. Ha. Jake says, brown tail moth is my biggest menace. I think you probably get a few amens from the background there. So um, without further ado, thank you for sharing your perceptions. And now let's let Allison and Bill take the lead and uh, teach us a thing or two about forest health in relation to climate change. Thanks, Allison and Bill. Okay, I'll start things off. Uh, Alice and I decided that we're going to divide this up into different climate events. And the first one we're going to deal with is uh, early season precipitation and impact on a couple of organisms that, that we've seen uh, respond to this. And the one first one I'll talk about is dealing with white pine needle blight or needle damage. And this is really dealing with, with uh, native fungi located, oh, zoom in, number of fungi that naturally occur on white pine. So they've been around, we're not dealing with invasive pests, we're not dealing with something that, that necessarily is newly introduced, uh, but really fungi that have been around a while. And then beginning around 2010, 2007, I think as early as that, we started seeing uh, a large amount of yellowing in the pine. And I remember the first spring I saw that, I was, went to a forest pathology meeting and people initially thought, oh, this is uh, salt damage, which we typically see on white pine uh, late in the spring. But no, this was occurring, uh, yellowing of the needles, it was occurring on trees well away from the highways and in all, all uh, aspects of the tree. And then we see, started seeing it repeating over a number of years and discovered it was a lot of these native fungi uh, we're getting into the needles, and then when people looked at it, that it was really, you look at the precipitation, the red line on this graph shows what the average precipitation is, and then it's looking at 2006. After that is when we for, saw the first big outbreak, and then periodically since then, we've had these really wet Junes or late springs, which is ideal time for fungal infection. So this is a case of climate not really impacting the tree, but impacting the, the survivability of the, the pest organism, in this case, the needle fungi. And the studies so far have shown that the spores pretty well spread within the trees. And so we see this development within the trees and trees that tend to get it one year seem to keep, keep getting it year after year. And uh, it's really, gone into a concern that some people have already reported declining trees and, and we're concerned that if this continues is that, that we're gonna see even more impact on the white pine. So it's these record early spring precipitation events, June, some of the wettest Junes we've seen on record is really helping these native fungi be successful in infecting the pine needles and then a year later resulting in the yellowing of the needles and premature loss resulting in reduction in growth. Okay. So Amanda, that's my introduction to that. Should Allison talk about hers and then we talk about the uh, precipitation events in general? Sounds good. Yeah, let's have Allison dive into her portion. All right, are people seeing my screen? Looks great. Okay, great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, just give a brief introduction on brown tail moths and I'll break the rules a little bit and talk both about spring precipitation and also um, the late summer, early fall temperatures. So just for those folks who didn't uh, get a chance to review the material ahead of time, brown tail moth is a 
insect pest that is native to Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. It arrived in North America in the late 1800s, right around the same time as gypsy moth, and in about the same location um, near Boston, Massachusetts. And it probably came over on live plant material. It has a really broad host range, so it feeds on uh, all sorts of hardwood trees and shrubs, but it does tend to prefer the rosaceae hosts. So in the forests, things like your black cherry, but also apple, hawthorn, service berry, um, and then also does really well here in Maine on our oak trees, both in the red and white oak group. Um, currently in Maine, we're finding brown tail moth in the same footprint as uh, basically the 1913-1914 extent that's shown on the map. So from uh, we had web detection in Fort Fairfield last month, all the way to uh, Bethel on the Route 2 um, in the western side of Maine. So we've had a real um, explosion of the populations in recent years. We're in the midst of a historic outbreak of this pest here in Maine. And then as far as uh, the climate impacts, um, there's a number of ways that climate will impact on things like insects, on insects. Um, they are, um, their development is really driven by climate, but I'm going to focus on a couple of stages of the life cycle of brown tail moth for this discussion. The first is the feeding larvae in um, the early spring, and that's where we're talking about the spring precipitation patterns and, and how they impact brown tail moth. And then the second is also the feeding larvae, but in the um, late summer and early fall. So this first period um, when the larvae are coming out of their overwintering webs, because right now they're tucked in tight to these nice warm sleeping bags. When they come out of their overwintering webs in early spring, the precipitation is what's really important as far as what's gonna happen to their populations um, going forward. If you have uh, increase in spring precipitation or higher than normal spring precipitation that is also well spaced throughout that spring and early summer period, then you have a greater development of disease epidemics within the populations. And those disease ep epidemics can help to push the populations down. And particularly important with brown tail moth is the fungal disease Entomophaga myomyga. There's also a specific viral disease that impacts brown tail moth, um, but it's really the fungal disease that is most driven by those uh, precipitation patterns. So the converse, if you have reduced precipitation, um, then you have a reduction in disease incidence and population growth. And I think, you know, the variability in patterns could almost be more important. Those extremes might be more important than, than what is average for that season as far as um, impacting populations. And then just moving on uh, briefly to the late summer, early fall temperatures with warming in the August through September period we can expect to see faster development of the larvae that hatch out of the eggs in the summer. So people are probably somewhat familiar with the native spruce budworm and its life cycle. When it hatches out of eggs in the late summer, it goes almost immediately into diapause. It has, you know, it molts, but it doesn't do feeding like the brown tail moth feeds in that late summer period. So, um, with brown tail moth, since it is actively feeding, it doesn't go directly into diapause. Uh, its development can really take advantage of those warmer temperatures. It develops more rapidly, becomes more robust going into that winter season and has better survival. I think that's what, I, what I'm gonna cover. We can open it up to questions once I figure out how to unshare my screen. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. So thanks, Allison. So we've got, um, let's see, does anybody have questions so far about what we've seen um, about spring precipitation? Uh, and again, Bill addressed some white pine needle damage and uh, a little bit about uh, brown tail moth here. Um, I'm not seeing questions in the chat so far. 
but maybe people are just getting warmed up. I wonder if because we're still in winter, or at least yesterday it felt like we were in winter, um, if maybe we should move on to warmer winters and people might come back, especially with some of the, uh, the insect life cycles, we might come back with some questions about spring precipitation. Um, so folks, I know you have questions, please drop them in the chat window. Um, in the meantime, uh, I think Allison, you're gonna go next with Southern Pine Beetle. Yep. All right. So in the context of warmer winters, um, we're going to look at southern pine beetle, and then Bill will give us a little introduction to balsam and hemlock adelgids. So let me there again. All right, is everybody seeing that screen Let's with southern go. pine beetle on it? All right, perfect. So as far as southern pine beetle, um, southern pine beetle is a dendrochinus species. It's one of our tree killer species and I use our kind of loosely. It's something that was not found in um, uh, New England real recently. Um, it is native to the Southern states and into South America and it attacks the hard pines primarily. Um, and Southern beetle, pine beetle expansion was noted in the early 2000s in New Jersey. They had um, one of their first outbreaks of recent memory, of recent history of southern pine beetle starting in southern New Jersey in 2001. And that continued and to continue to spread in New Jersey through 2014. In 2014, there was detection of southern pine beetle activity in Long Island, New York. And um, subsequent to that, there was also activity detected um, in upstate New York as well. Um, and so the questions come up as to, you know, why is this happening? And what appears to be driving this range expansion of a native insect in this case is um, the coldest minimum temperature of the winter. And so this graph here shows two locations in New Jersey, their minimum winter temperatures. And I mentioned that the first outbreak noticed in southern New Jersey in this part of the state was in 2001. And you can see that prior to those, to that period, they, they really weren't getting those lethal temperatures for southern pine beetle over winter. And uh, that continued for many years beyond. Um, climatically, there are models that predict that we are already vulnerable to southern pine beetle damage here in Maine. What would be most at risk would be our jack pine and pitch pine resources, especially those coastal resources. However, they are finding that in areas of uh, Long Island in particular and southern New England where they have southern pine beetle activity, the um, activity can also occur on other conifer species. So they are seeing attacks on white pine, for instance, when it's growing in places with the preferred host and also on uh, Norway spruce. So there's a lot of unknowns as far as when that does get here, what sort of host shifts might happen and um, just how bad that damage could be. Kind of the good news with Southern Pine Beetle is that with active management, there are ways to reduce the impacts of this pest. And I would also just mention that um, we do have other native dendroctinus here. And I know in um, Minnesota, they're having increased issues with um, the Eastern larch beetle, which is one of the dendroctinus species. They have a, a much more important larch resource in Minnesota than we do. And actually for them, the climate change is, um, you know, the beetles biology, which uh, is that it's developing more rapidly is additive on um, issues with getting freeze over winter in these uh, wet stands where they would normally harvest on frozen ground. That's what I have and I will stop share so that you can cover your topic, Bill. Okay. And Bill, when you share your screen, we had a request if you could go into presenter mode, um, that would be make it easier for folks to, to focus on what you're seeing on the slide. Is that possible? I can, is that on the PowerPoint or on Zoom for presenter mode? Uh, that would be on the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh-oh, uh, now I think we're seeing, sorry, now I think we're yeah. seeing the reverse. Um, maybe uh, you could you could um, just escape out of this. Oh, let's try that. 
Uh oh, now we're okay. There we go. Looks good. Looks good. That works. Looks good. You seeing it okay? Okay. So, what I noticed this is a study. This is actually from Allison Knoti's master's work that she did here a few years ago. But it was in the early 2000s, there was seen to be more mortality of the Boston Woolly Delgia, which actually has been here for about 100 years and restricted to coastal areas, and then had this outbreak in the early 2000s and try to do a study to understand what was going on. Balsamolia delgid is one that when it gets into trees, it, it feeds sap feeder. That's, um, I can get it to, okay. So you get the, the, phase where it's feeding on the stem of the tree. And for those of you familiar with beech bark disease scale insect, uh, the adelgid feeding there has the white fluffy uh, covering for it. So it gets, gets to look like that on the bark phase. It also has a twig phase and affects the, the fur crowns where you get these really ratty crowns with a little bit of stork nest on the top and eventually will, will kill the balsam fir. Um, Looking at the tree ring data and then looking at the climate, as we noticed that it's been recent years, the graphs I have up in the right hand corner shows the incidence of Balsamolia delta occurring on the trees. You can detect that in the tree rings and seeing that it's been steadily increasing since the 70s. And then you look at the weather records. So this is looking along the coast and then going inland and looking at the lethal temperature for the adelgid, which is minus 22 Fahrenheit, which is the same as minus 30 Celsius, and plot out how many years that, that those lethal, how many times a year that lethal temperature occurs. You can see on the coast where it's always been a problem is that those temperatures are rare. You get a bit ways inland, woodland on the Canadian border, about the same as Bangor Orono uh, along the Penobscot River is prior to 1940, it wasn't uncommon for winters to have up to 20 events going down to minus 30 Celsius or minus 22 Fahrenheit during the winter time. But since 1940, the incidence is down to five or less. And then right prior to the outbreak, there's basically no lethal events that, that have been occurring. And so thinking about this year is that, yeah, we haven't really had cold lethal temperatures. So it's winters like what I've seen this year is where likely it's going to allow the, the insect to develop more further inland than, than we've seen before. You go farther north and even in the years prior to the early 2000s outbreak, there was still a number of uh, lethal events that were occurring up in Aroostook County that you did not see farther south. So with Balsamolia delgid, I would think there's this clear relationship between these lethal temperatures that used to keep it in check, uh, populations in check up, uh, up to about 1940. But since then, the insects been gradually increasing as the number of lethal events have decreased. And in years where there just are, uh, there are no lethal events, then we really see this buildup of the, the adelgid population. Now, if I can get this to, there we go. Hemlock woolly adelgid. Balsam woolly adelgid is non-native. Hemlock woolly adelgid is the same. It's a non-native species. The population we have here in the US is originally from Japan's more maritime moderate climates. And so this adelgid also is, is vulnerable to winter temperatures. Uh, that it dies off even uh, at temperatures not as cold as what we see with the balsam lily adelgid, about minus 13 Fahrenheit is lethal. And even if you get down to temperatures that aren't quite as lethal, 
you still see a lot of mortality occurring to the, the hemlock woolly adelgids. So it's another one where minimum temperatures have an impact on the insect. Okay. So looking at the minimum temperatures, uh, did a study on this, looking at how it's spread in, in previous uh, years farther south in New England and they did a model to see what would happen in Maine if the, as the temperatures warmed in the winter time. And the model predicted that based on the temperatures we had in the 90s, about 92,000 acres of the state, primarily along coastal areas, would have about a 50% chance of hemlock trees dying. So pretty well restricted to, to coastal areas. But as uh, graphs have been showing is the number of times we have lethal temperatures has been in decreasing. So with the model set saying, excuse me, that if the average minimum January temperature is increased by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, you see that it's increasing, that we're now up to a half million acres, primarily coastal areas and getting into the southwestern part of the state that now become vulnerable to hemlock uh, declining and, and dying. That the adelgid itself probably can go farther, but to get high enough populations, it needs the warmer winters, and that's still going to be primarily near the coast. And then as uh, future climate models are accurate and we get even warmer, you can see that the intensity that it's very likely coastal areas will have such high hemlock woolly adelgid populations, that'll be tough for hemlock to survive on the immediately coastal areas and the mortality will be creeping its way inward. But fortunately, you get much farther than about 50 miles inland. And then you can see with the dark green is that the hemlock in that part of the state, while the adelgid may be present, probably the cold temperatures will still be enough to keep it at low enough populations where the hemlock farther inland should be okay. But uh, coastal populations in Southern Maine, Southwestern Maine, that as the warmer, as the winters warm up, uh, the chance of hemlock uh, dying from the adelgid is increasing quite a bit. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that info. So just again, reviewing, we had a little bit on spring precipitation, and then we were just talking about the effects of warmer winters. Um, so we did uh, have a question, Bill, that came in for you. Um, I think it was on the Balsam Woolly Adelgid slide. Um, so uh, Brendan Tracek is asking on, on Bill's location comparison slide, it shows no lethal events in a couple of places between 1900 and 1910. Is that true or just lacking data? It's true. I mean, the coastal areas are so moderated by the ocean that, that yes, the, the lethal temperatures don't occur there. And the Bosomoli adelgid has been uh, consistently uh, impacting, affecting the, the health of, of fur along coastal areas. It, it's a limiting factor for fur on, on the coast. Great. Thank you, Bill. And yeah, thanks for the question. So, Brennan, you can come down to the coast sometime and experience our uh, sometimes lack of the extreme colder winter temperatures. <laughs> Let's see. I haven't seen other questions in the chat, but I know people have them. So if you have questions, aha, if you, um, I'll get to Nancy's question in just a moment. Please make sure you post your questions in the chat window. So Nancy Olmsted is asking, she says, I missed the date through which the hemlock woolly adelgid minimum winter temps were modeled. How far out was that model shown in the map? Okay, the temperatures were based on tree core data. And so I would say basically we're looking at the tree responses in the 1990s. So we're looking at the winters as they were in the 1990s. And then the model was simply just increasing the minimum January temp. So the timeline for that depends on how fast our, our winters are warming up. So the first was looking at one degree Celsius or about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit and that increase the amount of acres up to about a million acres. And then the second was increasing by another degree, two degrees Celsius or about three, three to four degrees Fahrenheit minimum temperature uh, increase. And then that increased the amount of acres to 1.5 million. How fast that's gonna occur depends on how fast our, warm, our winters are warming. And that information I don't have. 
but the model is based on a one degree Celsius increase and then a two degree Celsius increase. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, we had another question for you. Um, to kill hemlock oleodelgid and balsam oleodelgid, are the lethal temperatures required for an extended time, day? It appears, uh, Allison can jump in anytime she wants. You want me to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> so I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so there's minimum, there's lethal temperatures that basically, you know, just a single exposure will kill the insects. And that's some of what was on on some of those comparison graphs that Bill had, one of the categories I believe was that temperature. And then there are temperatures where um, longer exposures to that temperature will kill a high proportion of the population. So, I mean, I think with almost anything with nature and climate, the simplest answer is it's really complicated. And a lot of times we really don't even have all the information, even with something like balsam oleodelgid that's been around for for quite a while. We don't really necessarily have all the information to understand just exactly how that temperature acts on the insect. Or, you know, again, with, uh, with hemlock woolly adelgid, similarly, um, you know, the time of year can be important um, for those colder temperatures. They're, they're more susceptible to colder temperatures this time of year than they are um, earlier in the winter. So potentially that Brutal day yesterday might have killed more adelgid than a day like that in December, say. So it's it is a, a pretty complicated question to, to answer and and understand. One thing I've seen with damage, this is both on plants and insects with winter temperatures, is the number of events does matter. Mm -hmm. uh, that even if you get cold events that aren't 100% lethal, say it's 50%, but if it happens four or five times, that could end up killing most of the population. So yes, it, it is complicated. You, the single event getting down to minus 20 Fahrenheit, uh, minus is, could kill, that single event could kill off most of the population, but a number of minus five, minus 10 Fahrenheit events uh, over the winter could also kill off quite a bit. So the frequency is important. So, you know, that's where it's hard to predict what's gonna happen each winter. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that um, makes me think about Allison's comment about um, uh, about, the, about the, the moth populations and just the variability, you know, in spring precipita uh, precipitation uh, just kind of drives the, the changes in those populations. So I wonder if, and similarly, if in winter, um, they're just like the variability that we have in winter from year to year. Like this was kind of a wimpy winter um, by many accounts. And I wonder, uh, you know, so if we have a wimpy winter this year and then we have a real normal winter next year, um, that might, does that also factor into uh, kind of the, the, the adelgid populations? I don't know if it'd be year to year as much as within year variation that might be more damaging. Um, there is some, you know, pressure on the populations, but they, their ability to withstand cold winter temperatures can change. Um, we've seen that in hemlock oleodelgid after its arrival to, to North America. Um, it's, it's the populations up here in um, New England, Northern New England are more cold hardy than the populations down near where they were introduced in Virginia, um, if you, take an adelgid from Virginia, it's probably not gonna do very well here. Um, well, maybe this winter would have done okay. Um, but but I do think that some of the, the real wacky winters that we get where it's, you know, way warmer than, than normal and then gets down really cold, that that can have more damage on populations than, than just that year to year variation. Yeah, I was gonna mention this winter, we haven't had many temperatures uh, above freezing, I and mean, when it has gone above freezing, at least where I am in Orono, it hasn't been that warm. And uh, what Allison is saying, that could have a big impact on the damage, is if you get period, long periods of warm temperatures, and the warmer, the more, uh, the more likely that if it gets cold again, you're gonna see damage. Uh, and that happens on insects, but I've also seen that on red spruce, uh, that same thing can happen. If you have a warm period, the tree basically dehardens, 
And then if you have cold temperatures after that, you'll get damaged. And then this year with the sun, sun is getting much warmer this time of year and you'll get these solar uh, warming on the twigs. And so that can also impact then the, the health of the foliage, but also the insects that's on the foliage, that they're vulnerable now to much more temperature swings this time of year than earlier. So uh, if we were to get sub-zero temperatures this time of year, that could be much more damaging to the insect than like Allison was saying, what, what could have happened in December. Oh, interesting. Um, we, I see three more questions in the chat window on uh, this topic of warmer winter. Just so folks know, uh, we do have another section about droughts coming up. So we're going to have our next three questions on uh, still on the warmer winters section, and then we were going to we're going to pivot to droughts. So uh, Jason asked the question: Would birds or would birds prey on adelgids, or are they just too small and noxious or obnoxious? <laughs> I don't I don't know of a lot of records of birds preying on them, but I can't say that they wouldn't. I I'm, uh, imagine they're pretty tasty if you get beyond the uh, woolly covering and if you're you're good at searching. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think they'd necessarily be noxious. I just, they may be too small to bother with, but I would imagine some of your gleaners might take them. I don't know. Um, I think Jason, you, you know more about bird biology probably. <laughs> Um. Oh, and I think yeah, we need to allow we need to allow Jason to unmute just a moment. <laughs> okay, Jason, if you want to unmute now, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious. I don't know, but I'll look through the the samples that I have for the the DNA barcoding and and oh, see if yeah. I can find any. I haven't done all of that analysis yet, but I'll I'm just curious because yeah, maybe maybe chickadees or creepers or kinglets would would worry about something that small. Yeah, we, I mean, we know birds carry adelgid from Mark McClure's work. Um, he gave a lot of birds baths and, and found viable adelgid on them. Um, but, but I don't know about eating. Most of the consumption is insect predators or, or uh, spiders or things like that that we know of. All right, thank you. So uh, next two questions, uh, you may have answered this already, but Gary Fish was asking, will these pests also develop more resilience as time goes on um, as cold temperature survivors breed? They, they're all asexual. So I think they are measuring some population changes, but because it's asexual, the, the change isn't happening much or what change happens isn't going to be to any great extent. Allison, you heard, heard anything? They have demonstrated a difference in the adelgid populations for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, not certain that it's really been looked at for balsam woolly adelgid because it is so much more cold hardy. Um, but, but certainly there is difference in the populations between different regions of the country here. And also from the different regions of um, the place where they're native or the places where they're native, um, there is a apparently more cold hardy strain in um, the highlands of Japan than the lowlands of Japan. And the strain that was introduced here is from the lowlands of Japan. So, but you know, they're, they're asexual, but they're, they're creating a lot of individuals. There's a lot of individuals for that selection to act upon. So I, you know, there is some adaptation, but fortunately it doesn't look like it it's going to adapt very quickly. So don't see much changes. Uh, I don't see much changes occurring in, our, in at least our immediate future. Let's hope we don't, let's hope they don't get too used to winter. Um, the last question before we pivot to the topic of drought, uh, Morton is asking, does initial tree vigor make a difference for balsam woolly adelgid mortality? Allison, you want to handle that? Uh, if I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it wasn't just a while ago, Bill. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that's kind of a hard, hard question to answer. Um, so more vigorous trees attacked by balsam woolly adelgid actually have a stronger response than less vigorous trees. And it's a little bit similar to people who have a strong immune response to something, they end up actually damaging themselves more. <laughs> in the process to reacting to the pest than, than if they were weaker. And so you see that in uh, the gout phase, you can see on the more vigorous 
growth, you get larger gouty growth on that material. Um, when it's in the trunk, it's actually um, the same process that's happening in that the tree is creating these large, um, really um, resinous cells um, that are really poor at conducting water. And so um, I never seen specific uh, coverage of that in the literature, but um, I would assume that that is also more vigorous on more vigorous trees, that production of the road holds and then the interruption of the water flow to the crown of the tree. Because they, from what I remember in the early 2000s where they picked it up as on sites where they had done some pre-commercial thinning and actually- Right, that's true. Yeah, had the open grown trees and those were the trees that died. So they just were a larger target and more foliage meant more food for the insect. And so the populations could increase. So unfortunately with this one, um, tree vigor isn't necessarily, it may help them initially withstand an infestation, but uh, the insect hangs on there. And uh, unfortunately it looks like where the delgid populations are allowed to build up with warm winters, the uh, you know balsam fir across the uh, the age classes and sites are, are going to be vulnerable. I just don't see where healthy trees are really going to be have a much of a benefit with this this insect. Oh boy, um, I think we would probably better pivot to the topic of drought. And while Bill is pulling up uh, his slide, um, Allison, do you want to just mention the resource you pasted in the chat window? Oh, sure. Yeah. Somebody had asked about recognizing winter webs of brown tail moth and distinguishing it from the tent caterpillar. And so I just put in the link there for our brown tail moth information page at the Maine Forest Service. We have a video there that shows um, winter web clipping. So that can give you an idea. And just the short answer is that those uh, tent caterpillar webs are going to be really loose and messy this time of year. And the brown tail moth caterpillar webs will have uh, caterpillars inside of them. They'll also have frass and cast skins, but they'll have caterpillars inside them and really bright white silk. Great, thank you. So Bill, do you have a couple more slides to show us? Sure. All right. Talk about drought. And let's see if I can, no. Nope. Nope. Okay. There we go. Click enough times and you'll get the computer to do what you want it to do. Okay. Okay, looking at drought. And this is primarily dealing with uh, an episode we had on white pine, again, in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, so really in climate impacts on trees in Maine have been going on for a couple decades at least. So. Uh, this is nothing, nothing new. It's it's happening now, and so that that's the concern about as climate changes more and we get more variation as to what are other other impacts it's going to have on the trees. It's already been having impacts over the past couple decades. So this is one instance on white pine that we had pine coming up in old fields and very high densities. So we had them stressed that way. Uh, it was growing on old fields where the the roots. We're not growing very deep. Pine doesn't have a tap root, so it, it roots don't necessarily go deep, even if it has sandy soil. There's ways of it can be obstructed. And then this is actually going back to 1995, is what's shown here. There was really a severe drought in southern Maine that time of year. And looking at the water flows here, and it's nearly three standard deviations below, which basically works out to a hundred year drought occurring late in the growing season when roots are normally growing. So uh, these were uh, an unfortunate combination of events that stressed the trees. And then we had the, the bark beetles and root disease coming in and stem fungi that were already in the stands and can take out weakened trees. And there are some locations where half the white pine uh, died off in these stands. So uh, some severe drought can really have an impact, especially on stands that are are dense, overstocked, like, like they were in the white pine. Um, another one that's associated with drought, and this gets into what Allison was talking about with the brown tail, is that high moisture can 
be lethal can result in mortality of some of our insect pests. And when you get dry years, that's gonna result in an increase in the insect pest. And this actually happened with beech bark disease. So this gets back to, we had a dry period around the year 2000. And after that is when we saw Balsamolia delgid issues. And then we have also had the beech bark disease issues here. And the beech scale can have, is, is a bit more cold tolerant. It requires minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit lethal, 22 Fahrenheit is damaging. And then looking at the temperatures is that, again, this is up at Fort Kent and yeah, it is cold up there. This shows the number of events that can occur each winter up at Fort Kent that gets down to at least minus 22 Fahrenheit or damaging. And that's true most of the years, except as we get around the year 2000, there are a few years there with few lethal events. And then also associated with that time, that time was a dry season, that 2000, 2001 was unusually dry in, in Maine in that part of the year. And August rain, when this insect is crawling around on the bark of the beach is when it washes off and has a high mortality. But we had warm winters, dry summers, and the insect populations exploded where before it had been controlled up along the, the Quebec border. And, and following that, we had a, a, a lot of beach dying off, both in areas where the disease had not been present because of cold temperatures, and then in other areas where the scale population could build up on, on the existing beach, beach trees. So after this time period, we had a, a noticeable increase in the amount of beach that was dying in the forest up in Northern Maine. So high scale survival due to the warm winters and dry August temperatures. Then the beach were also stressed by the drought and the combination resulted in quite a bit of mortality in that part of the state in, in the uh, decade of the 2000s. Okay. So, All right. yeah, dryness impacts the tree, but also insects the or impacts the organisms. With the needle fungi, the dryness results in less damage, but with insects, uh, uh, with insects, because the fungi go down, what Brown Allison was talking about with brown tail, their their mortality goes down with with drier springs, and then with the drought. We've seen with beech bark disease that really set up a situation with combined with warmer winters to result in, in beech bark disease, beech bark dieback. Great, thank you. Um, we'll definitely take questions now. And Tom Charles has one for you already. He says January 2009 had lows near minus 40 throughout northern Aroostook County. Any noticeable effect? As far as I know, it's like the Beach scale, this is the, up in Canada where they hadn't had it before. Again, after that, that uh, series of events in the early 2000s, the beach scale was noticeable, but I haven't heard of another outbreak since then. So I'd say the minus 40 is, is uh, indication that at least for the beach scale is that that temperature and other winters since then have been enough to help keep the, the scale population lower uh, in areas where it traditionally has been low. Great, thank you. Now I'm thinking that while people are coming up with additional questions, I wanna launch our third poll um, because we are wondering uh, what you are seeing as an audience out there. Have you seen forest health impacts from spring precipitation? Have you seen forest health impacts from warmer winters? And have you seen forest health impacts from droughts? So please feel free to share uh, in the chat window if you have a specific example um, and uh, maybe our, uh, our speakers can comment on those. Um, let's see, we'll give folks another 15 seconds. People are zooming in, filling out this poll. Any, uh, any quick additional thoughts you wanna add, Bill or Allison? I think it's I'll emphasize what I talked about before is that much of what I presented has been happening over the last 20 years. So the climate's already impacting the health of the forest. And so uh, I expect it's gonna be continuing with that and we're gonna see new combination of factors. So uh, unfortunately really can't predict what 
might be impacted in the future. It's very complicated, but um, when you start change, seeing changes in the climate is that uh, the living organisms, our forests are gonna respond and we'll just have to see how they respond. All right. Um, not everybody is paying attention to polls, um, but we are getting uh, about half the folks have paid attention so far. But in the meantime, Morton asked a good question that kind of emphasizes your point. Um, so he says, if weather affects beach bark disease survival, are local variations in beach bark disease impacts more likely associated with local microclimate or weather or with genetic variation and resistance? Well, with beach bark disease, that's for most of Maine, it can survive well, so I don't see that there, but I have heard that with balsam woolly adelgid, where it's like, you know, primarily coastal, but I talked to some foresters up by Moosehead Lake, where, you know, the size of the lake itself, and they've seen outbreaks of the adelgid up there. So I think with, with the adelgid, as hemlock woolly adelgid becomes more established on hemlock here, we'll probably start seeing that too. And that's kind of what the model showed, is that you, there's solid, yellow along the coastal areas, but soon you get inland, you get this mosaic of color. And yeah, I think with the adelgids, you're gonna see these microclimate impacts on whether the insect's able to develop or not. And with thank you. Balsam woolly adelgid in particular in some of those inland areas that get more snow, we tend to see um, more of the trunk phase of that, more populations on the trunk of the trees, um, which can actually be more damaging to the trees. Uh, you sometimes will not even get real crown deformity, um, not a lot of warning of the more the a sort of rapid decline and then mortality in those stands. So it can be really important to kind of watch those pretty closely if you have a lot of fur on the landscape, which hopefully, hopefully there isn't. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so folks, please feel free to type additional questions into the chat window. Um, I want to just share the quick results of this poll, thanks to people who filled it out. Um, so most folks have seen forest health impacts from spring precipitation. So I'm glad they were paying attention to Allison and Bill's presentation there. Um, and then uh, also, again, most folks, so not as many, uh, believe they have seen forest health impacts from warmer winters. Um, and just about everybody has seen forest health impacts from droughts. So that's interesting to see what people have been seeing and perceiving, especially after these presentations that really uh, closely tied a lot of, uh, of the, these different climate impacts to uh, tree species vulnerabilities um, and weather patterns and forest pests and pathogens um, making their way across the forest landscape. So uh, one, go ahead. One other comment I'd like to make is looking at the one comment was coming up about the, the healthy balsam firs in resistance, and I'm not optimistic there, but white pine's a different story. Uh, white pine, if you manage it and keep it at low densities, that really improves resilience of that species to a number of these stresses I've talked about here and other stresses. So that's one species that if you can manage it and keep it in healthy conditions, it's in much better shape to tolerate the the white pine needle damage, the drought impacts, uh, some other potential uh, canker fungi or stresses. So uh, management there works. Uh, balsam fir, it's, you know, if uh, budworm doesn't get it, it looks like the adelgid will. So balsam fir is, is just one species you don't want to have keep around. The shorter rotations you can do for the fur, the better. And beach is just one big headache of how to deal with that. Yeah, it's problem is in the, in the forest, it's a uh, problem, beach bark disease problems not going away and the way the climate can go, it could even get worse. So uh, that's yeah. a huge problem we have. In it, it is an important wildlife species though. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to, to uh, keep those uh, both uh, tolerant and resistant trees on the landscape if you can. Yeah, um, that, that is the importance. If you see resistant <laughs> beach trees, Yes, those really should be part of management plan is to protect those trees. On a related note, uh, Brendan is asking about white pine. So when, when do you release it? Uh, too early in white pine weevil will damage the tree. Yeah, it's let the trees grow high enough. You know, I'm looking at at least 20 feet. So I'm looking at your first release is once they get 20 to 40 feet tall and you wanna release it before the crowns get below 30%, you'd want at least 30% live crown ratio. 
for the trees to respond to the release. So it'll vary by site, but basically get 20 to 40 feet tall and that would be a good time. Otherwise, what we've seen is um, uh, another, the bass scale and also Clesiopsis canker starts to really develop in these trees if they're in high densities and start growing down 20 feet tall, these stem organisms really begin to develop and create some damage on the white pine. So yeah, need to grow up dense, regenerate in dense stands, but once they get 20, 40 feet tall, the sooner you can get in to start spacing them out, the better. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I know when we were preparing for this session, um, I was very tempted to try to push you guys to talk about solutions. Um, clearly, we have nearly filled uh, an hour with just talking about about the challenges. Um, but Bill, it was encouraging to hear you say uh, effectively that you know that white pine, um, you know, if you manage it well, that it can be more resistant to some of these challenges. So um, hopefully, in the future, we can talk silviculture. Um, Tom Charles had a quick note. He says at the state lot and top them. The best looking white pine was the part of the 1959 plantation that had 75% removed in 1989. There's significant mortality in there. Let's see. I'm, so I'm looking at, so there's 70%, there was significant mortality in the stand, even after removing the, the, the trees, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, I'm gonna allow participants and specifically Tom Charles to unmute. So uh, TC, if you wanna unmute real quick, uh, feel free to. Uh, the heavily thinned plantation had the best looking trees elsewhere. There was considerable uh, damage and some mortality in both the rest of the plantation and in the older pines around it. Okay. And when did the mortality occur? In the past, probably two or three years. Okay, we've, we've had some dry dry years. I've been kind of concerned about some of the white pine stand. Uh, most likely, what I would suspect at this point would be the soil conditions. Is This is what, in our study in the 2000s of the Maine Forest Service, we had a soil scientist work with us and explain that there's various soil profiles that restrict the rooting of the white pine, even as large trees. And that's where we saw some significant mortality. So if I were to suspect anything at this point from what you're describing is I'd want to look at the site to see if the soils were restricting the, the root development or not. These trees are all on uh, well-drained, deep alluvial soils near Mary Meeting Bay. It's that's what we've seen with others. It's, uh, do you have any type of loamy cap on the soils? The pine roots are restricted to the loamy cap. They will not go into the sand. And that's what we've found in other areas. And that's where we could explain why some areas where we're having high amounts of pine mortality was because the loamy cap was above the soil. You had three, four feet of sand, but the roots were just staying in that upper layer. Well, this is a deep, fine, sandy loam. I don't think it has a restrictive layer, uh, even though the plantation used to be a turnip garden. Uh, trees that tipped over in 2017 had root wads that were two feet deep. Okay, so um, I'd have to look, I'm not sure. All right, we are just about at the top of the hour. Um, I'm sorry to cut off the, the interesting dialogue here, but thank you so much to everybody for participating. Um, if you're looking for SAF credits, make sure that you make your name appear correctly uh, in the participant window, and it'll be easier for you to get your credits assigned uh, in, when we send the list of participants uh, to SAF. Um, please join me in a virtual round of applause for our presenters, uh, Bill and Allison. Um, this is really fabulous. There is just <laughs> So much information uh, tying forest health and uh, and and climate change. Um, we really appreciate your taking the time to distill all that information down into these bite-sized pieces so that we could digest it. Um, thanks so much for participating. Thanks so much um, to our presenters for speaking. Uh, and take care, everybody. Make sure you have a great day and stay safe out there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.